Hey everyone, so I think now we are ready to start. So good morning and good afternoon, Emir. Thank you for joining our today webinar, Ransomware Protection Best Practices for Veeam Cloud and Service Providers. My name is Anastasia, hosting manager here at Veeam, and today I'm joined by Neil Rollins, our system engineer. Also, we have Nick Fernal looking after Q&A section. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me and uh, you can see the slides. Um, I think we're going to go to the next one, uh, the most classical slide we have. Neil, can you move to it? Yes. I think everybody is already familiar with it. You've been automatically muted. Please leverage Q&A or chat functions in case of any questions. During the webinar, we will try to answer as many as time permits us. Otherwise, we will return to you after the webinar. As always, this session is recorded and we will share the recording and slides following the presentation. So what is the agenda for today? Uh, first of all, uh, we will do a little bit of overview of current situation with ransomware across the market, IT challenges, when does backup come into play and why ransomware is so damaging. Then, of course, we will go more into details how Veeam products can be an essential part of your ransomware protection strategy. Later, we will dive into demo of the product and, uh, of course, show you all the good stuff. And uh, then we will wrap up. So as simple as that, let's not waste any more time and go ahead with our webinar. So first of all, why ransomware is a disaster. So if Neil will move to the next slide, <laughs> I can show you some statistics uh, based on the latest uh, data protection trend report that was recently conducted. So this is the fresh numbers. Uh, we can notice that the cybersecurity event is not only one of the most common causes of the outages, but definitely most impactful in past two years. And then this trend is only keep rising. Furthermore, we also have prepared some additional scary numbers for you on the next slide. Um, the growth and evolution of ransomware is one of the most destructive trends of the last decade. This explosion has moved ransomware from an economic crime to one with immense global security implications. The primary negative effects on business from attacks are, of course, data loss, downtime, productivity. By looking at the numbers, we can notice that global cost has went from 325 millions to 20 billions USD dollars in just five years. Nowadays, there is one ransomware attack happening somewhere every 11 seconds. I think in 2022, we can always agree and definitely admit that ransomware is no longer a question of if, but when. And while ransomware is definitely a hot topic in the industry, the cause of it is quite an old school. So on the next slide, you can notice that spam is still number one attack vector. So why this happens? It's super easy. It relies on just one user to click something where they're not say, necessarily paying any attention. What we also found out in past five to seven years is that because of the easy of infection from malware attack like ransomware, the industry as a whole have come to realize that the idea that 100% detection is just not possible. So 100 accuracy is just a myth. Someone will click on something. And so a lot of companies are moving to more of a response posture where backup comes into play. As a matter of fact, if you look at all the next-gen security products like out there, uh, whether it's next-gen antivirus or a firewall or what have you, the best practice for your recovery is to restore from backup. So it's just as simple as that. No ransom needed if you have a reliable backup. Um, still, there is one of the questions that we get asked a lot. Why is ransomware so effective? The obvious answer is malware is being created and is evolving faster than it can be detected. Anti-malware providers see up to 1 million new pieces of ransomware per day. So if we imagine that they can possibly catch 99% of it, still they will be missing around 10,000 threats every 24 hours. 
The other issue is that effectiveness of ransomware is also enhanced by what I'll call poor network hygiene or poor security hygiene. So here on the slide, you can see top seven reasons why attacks have been successful. Let's elaborate a little bit more and provide some details. Um, for example, untested backups. Customers who don't follow best practices will find their data isn't access, uh, accessible when it's needed. The lack of testing also makes registration too slow. That's why some companies go with paying the ransom in hopes of getting some data back. Alerts fatigue. Actually, during the target breach in 2013, the security tools saw the attack and notified the security team. Unfortunately, the team was seeing so many alerts, they just missed the important ones. Um, classical one, poor password po policy. Still, one to three passwords is very popular. Many IT staff also use their admin accounts for day-to-day -day work. Passwords are not changed regular. Lack of two-factor authentication can also be an issue. Um, lack of segmentation. Flat networks are, of course, easy to manage, but also allow malware to spread easily. On the other hand, some networks are just so complex. So this all or nothing approach is putting companies at risk. Inconsistent policy. The move to the cloud is so easy, it can be done without IT involvement, leading to poor security choices. In some cases, data center policies are applied to cloud operation, and that simply don't work. And of course, don't forget about misconfigurations or missing patches. We can talk hours on why, when, how it affects, but I think we should go to the most interesting and important part of our webinar, how Veeam can help you out. On this, Neil, I'm passing mic to you. Marvellous, thank you. So, hi guys, um, I'm effectively here to talk to you about what Veeam are doing around ransomware. Now, this isn't to say that Veeam can protect against ransomware, but what we can do is help yourselves and your customers recover from ransomware. Um, and do the right things to protect your backups and your data um, in regards to ransomware. So it's not going to um, change the fact that we still need to stick to our 3-2-1 our three two one rule. It doesn't change the fact that we still recommend, obviously, Veeam is installed under best practices. We make sure that we have VLANs, network segregation, and the, and the general protection of your Veeam or your backup environment and make sure that that is separate. Um, but again, if we're going to talk about some key things here, let's talk about immutable storage and, and how we're implementing that and how we're protecting you across the board. So something I always like to talk about is, is what is immutable storage? Because usually what I've found is dependent on who I ask, immutable storage can be dependent on what they've been told previously um, and other areas. So immutable storage, it can't be changed, deleted, or when we say moved, we, we mean moved away or taken off. Um, so immutable storage is there to protect your backups and effectively silo them away. So our Veeam hardened repository, for example. What that doesn't protect you against is if you have a fire or a flood, if your immutable files are stored in a single location, you can still lose those backups. So it's really important that you make sure that they're stored in multiple locations. And again, when we talk about immutable storage or immutable backups, um, there is also a, a level of confusion within Destructible. Now, what do we mean by that? So immutable files or immutable backups can be on a Veeam hardened repository, for example. They could also be on a, on a storage appliance or some storage integration where we, we lock those backups away. But if there is still root access to that storage or there's a, a potential way to attack that storage, those backups can still be cleared down. So when, when we talk about indestructible backups, what we're referring to is immutability on several levels, but also making sure that those backups are stored in, um, let's say, AWS um, S3 object lock. So for you to clear those backups down, um, I, I guess you'd have to be a high level up employee of AWS or something like that. So effectively, it's calling on those backups, asking Veeam or, or alternatively logging in as root to delete the backups and making sure that that can't happen. And that's the differentiating points between indestructible and immutable. Um, so again, really important. When we talk about what we offer um, our customers for immutability, as you can see here, we've got our performance tier, um, our capacity tier, and our archive tier. Now, 
we've got our hardened repository at the bottom left where we add that immutability flag to our backups and stop them from being cleared down. We can also create a scale out repository and then we can add those immutable backups both into capacity tier and archive tier. So dependent on what your customers want, we could have the immutable on premises, we could have immutability in capacity tier, we could have it in archive tier. Obviously, um, yourselves, you could issue out S3 compatible storage that offers immutability for your customers if you wanted to. Um, and again, we're talking about immutable here. In terms of how that could look for the customer on a, on a simplified diagram, they could have their customer workloads that we then back up to the localized hardened repository as, as a point one, as you can see. We could have a secondary hardened repository on a second site for that 321 rule, making sure it's off site, but it's still contained within the network. And again, what we then talk about is moving that data off and adding the service provider storage layer or the S3 immutable object storage in the cloud, making sure that we have multiple copies of our data and ideally some of those copies outside of your domain or your network. So it's it's completely separate. If you have an issue on premises or if you have potentially two sites that are fairly localized to each other, we want to make sure that those backups are not only secure and immutable, but they're held offsite in an alternative location. So when we talk about our, our immutable storage and, and how does that actually look, um, let's say that the environment's been breached and the and the attacker manages to to find the Veeam server. Let's say it's an existing customer, they haven't they haven't got a localized version of Veeam, they don't have it on a separate domain or anything like that, so it's completely open. But we are using immutable storage. So they try to delete the backups, they log into Veeam, they try and delete them. What Veeam will do is it will try and access the backup files and do as it's been asked to do. So it will try and clear those down. As we can see, the request has been made to delete the backups. And then what they'll receive is they'll get an unable to delete the immutable backups because they're protected for a certain amount of time. Now that is obviously dependent on what your customers or, or what yourselves, if you're setting out, want to set that to. Um, if we're running a POC, we definitely don't want to protect those backups for three years in the cloud. Um, and what we tend to see with our customers is they tend to go for seven or 14 days on premises and then they move those backups off. So when we're talking about recovering those backups and, and something we often see is an item where a um, ransomware or malware is embedded directly with the, um, the backups. So they will log on to the, uh, the domain if they manage to breach it, they will implement the ransomware and then they will put those backups or embed those, sorry, embed those malware pieces or ransomware into the backups. So then when your customers try to recover their data, they're recovering the ransomware along with that. So they, they've got their backups, they're intact, they recover, the backup is, or the server is restored back to the environment, and then the ransomware just triggers again. And that's where Secure Restore comes in. So what Secure Restore does on the left is obviously without being Secure Restore, the backups are recovered, the ransomware is restored straight into the environment and they're back to square one. With Veeam Secure Restore, what happens is we've got our immutable backup that we've recovered because they haven't been able to clear the backups down. Um, they've realized that there's ransomware within that backup. So part of Secure Restore is that we call on that backup and we restore the server into the environment. Secure Restore or Veeam's integration with the antivirus that, that is within the environment scans those backup files before they're committed back into the environment. And then it will highlight to you whether um, there's any nasties that's on the backup and ask you what you want to do, whether that be to disable the NICs or whether that actually be to restore the um, abort the restore altogether. Um, equally to that, we've got another data labs piece, again, which you can reach out to your, your Veeam contacts and they can take you through that further, in which case you can use this secure restore in our data labs piece, and it enables you guys to effectively test that out of hours or, or on the weekends, which means that the testing can be done automatically. So you can kick it off, we can do those tests, do those checks without having to commit manpower to that and, and losing precious time that we wanna spend with our families. So on that note, what we'll do is I'll open up a demo, I'll show you the different ways that we can approach the, the immutability and, and different ways that you may want to implement that with, with customers or yourselves. Um, and hopefully then 
we can generate some questions out of that and, and it effectively means that you can uh, you can ask Nick and the team in the chat lots of nice questions. What I'm going to do is open up here. So as you can see, I have my Veeam server and I've cleared away quite a lot of jobs to make it nice and easy so you can see what we're working with here. So my initial backup is I've got my local repository that is going to immutable storage. The reason that I have this is because it's it's a really useful use case for a customer that is currently using a standard Windows repository that's not immutable. So they're going to a localized repository and then they say they approach you guys or, or they approach their their um their IT team and they say, look, we want immutability, but we need to add it onto our existing infrastructure. So as you can see here, if I go to my backup infrastructure tab. Um, and then I go to my scale out repositories. Let me just scale this out quickly. Um, what we've got on repository two is, or repository one, if I show you, when we go to our performance here, we've got our repository. In this case, on one, I've got my hardened repository, so it's a nice clean setup. And on scale out repository two, I've got my local repository, my Windows repository. So on the next step, so let me go back to one. The reason I'm going to one is because I've got a few different um, object storages set up under my capacity tier is I'm going to my Veeam object storage here. The reason that I'm doing this is because it enables me to add my object storage or, or my immutable object storage into an existing environment. And again, ticking this box here to copy my backups to object storage as soon as they're created and move my backups to object storage once they age out. When we configure this, it's going to ask you whether you want to move your backups up to object storage. So it's really, really useful. You can simply commit to uh, direct object storage, whether that be AWS, or whether you want to go to S3 compatible storage, add it into a scale out repository, and build out that existing Veeam infrastructure and add in that immutability and also add in the tick boxes there to make sure that you're compliant if that's something that's being asked for. If we go back to home, as you can see, I've got a number of objects in mind where I'm taking backups and committing them. So I've taken the backup, committed it to local storage, and then that will then be tiered out to our immutable storage, as you can see with cloud. I've got my other one, so just going to local immutable. So what I'm saying there is if I go to this job and I look at the storage that I'm using, I'm going to my scale out repository one. By going to scale out repository one, if we go back to our backup infrastructure, as we can see under properties, I'm going to my hardened repository. So I'm, I'm, I'm gaining that immutability both on premises as we talked about before, and then I'm also moving it to object storage in the cloud. So I have immutability both on premises and in the cloud. Maybe that's something you want to achieve. Maybe if there's multiple avenues of attack, we want to add that level of protection there. And then finally, as we can see, we've got our service provider option here also to get those backups off site into the cloud. I have my test backup here that's going to my Veeam Cloud Service Provider. Now, when I talk about the VCSP and the, and, the, and the service provider, you've got that option to tick to make sure that the backups are protected against any insider threats. So we have the offsite backup, so we're getting those backups offsite and away from risk. From there, what we're then doing is we're ticking that checkbox and making sure that any backups that are damaged or or are tried to be or are tried to delete um, that they try to delete and then those backups are cleared down. Again, they're protected by the service provider and they've got that tick box, they've got that ability to protect the backups. So if anything does happen, the service provider's got that safety net to catch those backups and restore them if needed. Um, you can use these in tandem, as you can see, I'm using them here. We can use on-premises immutability, we can use cloud immutability, we can use both, and then we can add the VCSP aspect as a third layer of protection there. So it's giving you multiple different ways to protect yourselves and to protect your backups. And more importantly, giving you the strength to recover, not only because we're cloud agnostic and we're hardware agnostic, so you can recover where you want, but it gives you the flexibility there 
that if there's a multiple points of attack or multiple avenues that you've got concern for, it allows you to recover to different areas. So I guess the next step is, what happens if that ransomware is embedded and how does Secure Restore look? Is it as easy as it sounds? So if I go to uh, my backups here, let's go to, as we can see, I've got multiple backups on, restore, on uh, my repositories. I've got this server here. I want to restore the VM. So we've got ransomware. I want to restore the entire VM. So I'm going to click on that option here. I can see my VM. Maybe I want to go to a specific point, but at the moment I just want to get back up as quick as possible. I want to restore to the original location. And again, I can even use quick rollback if needed. The next step I get is this secure restore, the bit that we were talking about. Now, something that's really important around this, and if there's um, a, a requirement to use it, is something that Veeam's talking about at the moment, and hopefully you should see, dependent on what regions you're in, is something which we call hands-on labs for our potential customers. If the customers are interested in using this and they want to see how easy it is to set up ransomware protection, and, and by that what I mean is the protection for your backups, and also go through the store, secure restore process and use Veeam in anger, let's say, um, reach out, talk about that Veeam hands on labs, they're there, use them, try and leverage that, that use case. I can click on this top box here, which is scan the restore. Uh, scan the restored machine. So what this is going to be is it's going to be a quick scan. It's it, we're, we're triggering the antivirus and we're saying, look, let's scan all the areas that we usually find malware and we find those nasties in and let's have a look at those. We can proceed with recovery, but disable the NICs. So let's recover the server. If we detect something, let us know that there's something on that machine. Disable the network adapters. We're going to deal with that. We're going to address it. If we know that we've got more backup points and we just don't want to go through those stages, we can click on the abort VM recovery. The reason we're going to abort it maybe is because we want to restore it into maybe a, a DMZ, into a completely locked off location where we can troubleshoot. Or alternatively, if we've got other backup points in different locations, maybe we're just going to go to a different backup point. And then finally, scan the entire image. It's very much like a deep scan. So we've got quick scan, deep scan, and different variations of what you guys can proceed with in terms of if that's detected or not. And then finally, we've got our reason and our summary. So it's exactly the same as doing a normal recovery, but Veeam are giving you those extra tools to protect yourselves against recovering ransomware into the environment. With Veeam, it's all about being that safety net for you. We can't necessarily stop users from clicking on links or, or opening ransomware within the environment. But what we can do is we can give you all the tools as best we can to enable you to be smarter and to recover in a cleaner and better way. And again, just to show you, if I go to my cloud, so as you can see, I've got my backups locally. I've got my backups in the cloud. If I go to my VM restore, we've still got the secure restore option. We're not taking that functionality away if it's stored in a specific location. When you go with Veeam, we're hardware agnostic, we're cloud agnostic, we give you the ability to recover where you want to recover to, and we're gonna build this functionality and give you as many tools as we can to enable you to recover as cleanly, as quickly as possible. Um, again, building around that product. Hopefully that's all fairly straightforward. Um, I'm just going to have a look. Is there any questions that's come through so far that anyone's seen? Oh, okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to highlight my server. I'm going to run a secure restore and I'm going to show you how it actually works and it kicks off. We can restore to the original location. We can use quick rollback again. And we've got the secure restore functionality. So again, tick box here. To speed things up slightly, what I'm gonna do is go locally because I don't have to go out to the cloud. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna exit my restore. I'm gonna to go to my local backups. We're gonna do restore. Look at that server. 
I'm going to restore to the original location because I'm quite happy with that server. I'm going to click to quick rollback to try and speed it up yourselves. Let's speed up that process because I'm going to be doing multiple things in the console just to show you what we can do. I'm going to scan the image. I'm going to abort the recovery if it detects anything. I'm going to click next. We can leave our reason as blank in this case. And then finally, in my summary, it's going to tell me that the current one is in the infrastructure. That's fine. I'm happy with that. And again, do I want to power that VM on after restoring? If I do, I can leave that two box. If not, I can click no. Now I'm going to click finish. OK, so we're going through this restore. I'm going to close this off. We'll leave it running. As we can see, we've got some running jobs there. And then what I can do also is why that's running, maybe I want to go to a location and clear our backups down. So if I go to extend, see if anything's been moved up yet, look at my local, I've got my guest file restore, and I've also got an object that's going up to my object storage here. So this is taking quite a while. So let me drop back. If I go to my restore points, let's try and delete these from disk now. As long as I've configured this correctly, which hopefully I have, and the demo gods are shining on me today. If I click delete from disk, am I happy to delete? Yep, yeah, that's fine. So from there, I'm using local immutable. Okay, fine. So that's fine. It's telling me that it's currently using my backup, so it's recovering. So what I'm going to do, let me cancel this one. I'll kick off a restore from my other localized backup that is not immutable because I'm tearing this off to immutable. So local to immutable, and then I've got local immutable. So let me run a recovery directly from here and we'll scan it and we'll do it the other way around. So restore, next, restore mode, original location, quite happy and quick rollback. Scan, abort, because I don't want to bring it back into my environment. We'll leave the reason as blank because I'm restoring. But again, if we want to put a reason in there, that's fine. It's going to highlight that it's cleaning the machine down. It's completely fine for me. And then from there, I'm going to click summary, and then I'm going to click finish. So we've started that one off. What I'm going to do is check what's running. Got my restore running and my cloud tier, which is perfect. Hopefully, the job that I cancelled is finished. So let's have another go at clearing those backups down. So I've logged into Veeam, highlighted the restore points. I'm going to click delete from disk. And then what you should see, if everything's worked with me and the, and the demo got have worked well, is exactly the same message that I showed you guys within the Power within our PowerPoint session, our slides, showing you that the backups can't be cleared down and they're protected. So as we can see, it started my request, it's preparing for deletion, I'm making sure that I've named it correctly and clicked on the right job, which um, if I've had enough coffee this morning, what we should see is Veeam's gonna go away, it's gonna talk to our storage, it's gonna make a request to say, I want to clear these backups down. And then again, as long as I've got my steps correct, it's gonna stop and protect those backups and tell Veeam you can't clear those down for a specific amount of days, and that's entirely up to you. So as we can see, I've clearly had my coffee this morning and I've set this up correctly. So it's unable to delete our backups because they're immutable. It's told me when they can be deleted or cleaned up. And again, it's told me what it's done. So zero deleted, zero skipped. It's given me a warning. And again, the job's finished. It can't do it, it can't proceed. And you're gonna get this same option um, whether you try and delete that from locally, uh, from cloud, it's all about giving you that immutable protection and protecting you around what you're doing and protecting your backups. And again, you can still gain that from the service provider as well. It's not limited to local, it's not limited to cloud, and it's definitely not limited uh, with a service provider. You can use all or you can use just one of them. The key thing here is making sure that we configure the environment correctly and that we make sure that it's set up as best practice. We separate Beam out and it works. As we can see, 
I've got my full VM restore running. I click on this, and as we can see, so what it's done is it started scanning. It's highlighted that not all disks are going to be scanned because I didn't do a full backup. Uh, sorry, a full scan. That's going to be a lot more time consuming here. Um, my hope was that this might have proceeded given that I'm running it on flash. So therefore, it might have been a little bit quicker for you guys. Um, but again, it's scanning through the disk, checking that VM, making sure that it's clean before it gets restored into the environment. And you can do that from any of your recovery points as well. So if we're recovering from cloud, if we're recovering from the service provider, or if we're recovering from localized storage, the functionality is all there to protect you guys. On that note, <laughs> I'll minimize that one because it's it might take take a while. And I'll pass back to Q&A if we've got any questions. Hopefully that was fairly straightforward. Um, again, theme is nice and simple. It's clean and easy for you guys to set this up. So the key point here is showing you that you can gain immutability and you can gain these tools that Veeam gives you and implement them in a nice, easy way that's clean and easy. Looks like we've got a few technical difficulties with someone's mic. Um, I thought we were going to read through the questions, so bear with me 30 seconds. I'll just see what's going on with the audio. So I'm, I'm going to try and attempt to read the questions and answer them um, as I see them. So can service providers sell immutable repositories as a service to a customer? So if you want to offer out S3 object storage immutability, then yes, that should be fine. If you want to use Linux hardened repositories, it's built into Veeam. Um, so if you are providing a service on their site, um, then it's something that's built in. If you want to offer professional services around that and, and build in the immutable repository into their environment, I guess there, there could be the professional services play there. Um, I'm sure that Nick's got um, some further information around if you wanted to maybe offer out immutable storage at the service provider end. Um, but you've got a level of immutability there because if you try and clear the backups down, the service provider is going to protect them anyway. So again, it's about building out, I guess, what immutability means to the end customer. Um, if immutability means that the backups can't be cleared down or anything like that, then that should be fine. Um, but again, if not, 
then we want to go down the S3 route. So it's, it's all about confirming what actually works. Uh, right, let me have a look at the next one. So what we, okay. what we would like to see is forward, forever forward incrementals with synthetic falls is, is the default. Um, we have seen reverse incrementals go to hardened repositories, but the, the problem you've got to bear in mind is when we're adding immutability to a repository, um, we need to merge the blocks in for our synthetic falls. So when I say that, what we mean is we need a clean chain before we can clear it down. So if you did use forever incremental, let's say, on a hardened repository, you would never be able to clear the chain down because the fall would always be immutable and then your incrementals would also be locked. So what we recommend is that you do what Beam's, what Beam's best practice is, which is forever forward with synthetic falls, and then that enables you um, to make best use of immutable. So, uh, I've, I've, I've just uh, opened up more questions. to a, a different AV vendor that is not already pre-built into Veeam as per the help center. Um, what you can do is go to the other antivirus vendors Q&A pages or support pages and download the command lists that you need. And then it's as simple as adding those command lists into the notepad file in the Veeam directory. It's all, it's all nice and straightforward in the help center, but you can use other antiviruses outside of the default supported ones by Veeam. Um, yeah, so the service provider can protect storage. So when, when you have the Veeam Cloud service provider option, when you're configuring your storage, there's a checkbox that says um, the service provider recycle bin. That's what I'm referring to. So when you enable the recycle bin, what happens is if someone was to delete those backups from the Veeam customer end, um, it would protect the backups on the service provider end by either moving them into a separate folder that is then secure that you can or the service provider can restore if needed. Or alternatively, um, you'll get an error message saying that you can't clear them down. Um, it's slightly different to how a immutable storage marker would work. So normal hardware for Linux hardened repositories. So best practice is always going to be servers with disk. So whether that be um, any any of the people that you buy servers from, HP, Dell, um, Supermicro, Lenovo, um, Fujitsu, any of those guys. So a normal server with disk, Ubuntu installed on that. So Linux, Ubuntu, um, and then from there, you, you configure the lockdown and the hardened repository and any backups will be written to that disk. It also means that you can silo it. So by that, what I mean is when you configure that hardened repository to best practice, you're going to disable um, the access requirements for that hardened repository. So when you add the hardened repository into Veeam, we use a single access key to create that, that initial link. Then Veeam discards any um, usernames or passwords that's held for that hardened repository, and it just retains the link to create the backups onto the hardened repository. What we usually see is because it is a siloed box, so a server with disk on the front and then configured as a hardened repository, SSH is disabled, the firewalls are, are brought up, Veeam can only write and read backups to that hardened repository. And then if you want to, the only way to access it, excuse me, would be done through um, IPMI, ILO, IDRAC, or similar. You could, if you wanted to, 
configure that differently for yourselves if you wanted to leave SSH enabled or, or anything else. But again, what we recommend is that it's a completely siloed box um, and therefore you've got to access the, the kind of back end interface and then use um, the, the um, graphical interface or, or even command line if you want to um, through the IPMI. To, to basically best protect yourselves. Um, again, that means that the front end will be protected. Um, yes. What's the preferred backup set type to use for hardened and S3 immutable? Uh, what happens if the initial backup is finally being processed because um, once the files and the backup have aged out in the past? So basically the immutable storage works the same way a normal beam backup would. So when we when we take a standard backup, we will take our full and then our incrementals for that point. If let's say you have 14 days immutability, we'll take the initial backup, we'll take our incrementals for those points onwards, and we will run for 14 days. Once we get to seven days over that immutability point, we'll be able to clear the first seven days down. So although you have 14 days immutability or, or however many days you wish to set actually, um, what you need to bear in mind is any overage that's there because we still need a clean chain before we can actually clean that back up. up. So um, normally, again, 14 days on premises um, and then let's say anything over 14 days gets moved to cloud up to three months to six months or something like that. Again, keeping immutability there. And then you could then choose if you wanted to, to move that to Deep Archive or Glacier or, or similar um, and still keep that immutability for longer term retention if that's something that you've got. Um, again, I will do my best to type out a lot of these replies as well, um, just in case there's anything that I've not made clear or I could potentially miss something. Um, scroll down. Uh, so again, the the if your server has malware and the existing antivirus product has not picked that malware up as per the secure restore, you can choose to install an alternative antivirus on the mount server that we're using to restore the actual backup files through. So in let's say antivirus vendor one didn't pick it up that's completely fine install antivirus vendor two again make sure that we can call on those calls to use antivirus vendor two um, and then you can just use that one instead so again it's it's completely up to you what antivirus you use and if you choose to change that the backup is safe i guess the, the the backup is safe question is the same question as immutability when i refer to a safe backup i refer to in a backup that is immutable on premises. That backup is then replicated to a second location that is also immutable. And then the third backup is then stored in a cloud location. So it's conforming to the Veeam 321 rule. Um, again, safe is a bit of a, when I refer to safe, I would imagine that your headquarters is on site. You're going to have server cabinets that are all locked. Your environment conforms to best practice. Um, you're using immutability both on premises, off premises with backups in multiple different locations um, and everything is patched um, exactly as we said before in the earlier slides. It's it's all down to doing as much as you can to protect yourselves and put in, in the hard work early so you don't have to put in the hard work late um, because again it's not a question of if you get hit with ransomware it's normally a question of when. Um, no, so again, we utilize, uh, someone's asked what kind of virus scan we, we use. We use whatever vi antivirus you are running on the mount servers. So it's not Veeam's antivirus, it's whatever you guys are running. Um, we're, we're definitely not a virus vendor. Um, we, we just deal with backup. Why don't you always use immutability? So, um, it's entirely up to you. The normal reason most customers don't always use immutability is because they don't have the storage. Um, they, they basically don't have the storage available on site to have immutability in all locations. So normally when I have a customer engagement or I talk to a customer, 
the the normal conversation is well if i turn on immutability and then i allow for that that little bit of um overgrowth because we need to clear the backup chain out i don't have enough storage what are my options again that's when we talk about adding immutability in the cloud so the ideal scenario is there is always immutability in play so we have immutability on premises and in the cloud that's what we would love it's just not always a function that customers can go for um, normally down to storage as opposed to anything else so do we um, at the moment there is not immutability in Azure cloud um, there Azure immutability, as far as I'm aware, is due to land. Um, so I would recommend you go and have a look at um, the Azure Marketplace or Azure Blob and, and basically look at when uh, immutability goes GA there. Um, again, it's something that we're aware of, so keep an eye on our updates. Um, and then once, once it's live on Microsoft, um, fingers crossed, in our updates you should see. Will it be available in version 12? I don't know, is the honest answer. Um, Again, keep an eye out for our version 12 launch or, or any snippets that we've got there. I get them the same time as you guys. Um, so again, it's uh, they, uh, our R&D guys bring it to all of us at the same time. So we're just as excited as you are. Yes, so ideally Veeam's best practice is to run local accounts, primarily because if someone breaches your environment or your domain, they've got full visibility and access to all the Veeam servers and components. That is definitely not ideal. Um, so again, Veeam's best practice is to always use localized accounts, make sure that the servers are localized. Alternatively, have a backup domain if you like domain accounts. Nothing wrong with that. Um, just make sure that it's separate from your primary domain. The last thing that we need is your backup server being affected by anything that's, that's affecting the primary domain. Um, alongside that, Use Enterprise Manager. Use the tools that Veeam, Veeam has there. So Enterprise Manager is a really, really good and powerful tool um, to, to add that extra level of protection there, making sure that we've got belt and braces and all those areas are covered. So is there a plan to change the recycle bin option to be do not allow delete from client sites uh, or restore options? I'm not too sure. Um, I can definitely go away and find out for you. Um, but as far as I'm aware at the moment, the recycle bin is an option for the service provider, whether they want to enable it or not. Um, normally, it's because if backups are cleared down, it can consume extra storage. So the service providers, some, some provide it, some don't. Uh, some provide it for a fee. Uh, always definitely worth asking the question. No, so if you've got a full, uh, sorry, so when using incrementals with periodic synthetic falls in a hardened repo, are the incrementals only locked after the chain is complete? No. So when we take a fall, we lock it. Every corresponding incremental that we write, we also apply the lock to. Will it be uh, ECSP to manage custom encryption keys? Um, the, will it be possible in the future version of v, uh, VSPC to manage customer encryption keys? Um, I will pass that one to Nick because I'm sure that he is either asking for it or already knows the answer. Sorry, I just uh, misclicked. Um, yes, so we have the Veeam Best Practices website, which you can go to, which is managed and maintained by the Veeam Architects. Um, there's also the Veeam Help Centre. Um, equally, go to the forums, ask our guys. We, we can point you in the right direction in terms of links. Um, so, yeah, Nick, there is, there is options there. Um, I will do my best to reply with the links. Um, in the answer, I'm just trying to get through as many questions as I can for you guys. Um, anything I do miss, I'll reply to. Even for the ones I'm talking about now, I'll do my best to actually reply. Um, well, reply on email or text or, or however we can get that out to you. Uh, Roy, so 
if something goes wrong with uh, with the backup chain and you need to do an active fall but need to clear the space of old backups before you can do that, will you need to wait for the immutability? Yes. So that is, again, as we highlighted um, in some of the earlier questions, if you are constrained on space, immutability is something that you really need to bear in mind. So if you do need to clear a backup chain down at uh, day 15 and you've got 30 days immutability, um, you will have to wait until you get to the overage days of that 15 days. Um, so you can't just clear immutability down. Um, again, I caveat that between immutable and indestructible and where that storage is. But primarily, if you have immutable backups, they are truly immutable and can't be cleared down, even if you have an issue. Uh, can we include a full copy of the Q&As and answers uh, for this pack as it would be super useful? Um, I don't know. I would hope so. Um, I will ask um, the guys and see if we can send all the Q&As out. Um, my, ideally, we can get as many answers to you guys as possible. So, yeah, why not? Uh, with Forever Incremental and using, say, 14 days and 15, would day one back up? no longer be protected. So immutability takes precedence over your retention policy, but the retention policy continues to run after immutability. So you can have 30 days retention with 14 days immutability. It just means at day 15, if you're using uh, incrementals, it will no longer be protected, yes. So again, uh, for, uh, for forward incremental with synthetic falls is, is the preferred way to go when we're doing immutable. Uh, does Linux hardened repo XFS format work the same way as ReFS? Uh, pretty much. So yeah, you're going to get the same sort of dedupe and compression and stuff that you're going to see. Um, so yeah, again, XFS works the same way as ReFS in terms of compression. You won't see a great difference between choosing uh, XFS over ReFS or vice versa. Primary gain is obviously immutability. Uh, if you go uh, from a, what happen, immutable storage is currently not available in Azure right now. Yep. So what happens when you offload immutable backups from an immutable local storage to Azure Blob or Azure Cloud? Um, they're no longer immutable. So they, they keep their immutability flag because that's part of, of the flag that we can apply to that backup. Once they're committed to a localized hardened repository, when they move out to cloud, they are then made unimmutable unless you are using immutable storage in the cloud. Um, equally, you could always deploy a um, hardened repository or, or immutable storage on uh, in the Azure cloud, just not blob. Um, but again, th th there's quite a few costs around that. So again, watch this space. Um, is using immutable storage as good as uh, as good as or a replacement for air gaps backup such as tape? Tape is always going to be um, air gaps, right? Um, what I would recommend is if you are trying to if you're trying to get an air gaps backup um, and you want to move away from tape, what I would recommend is potentially using post uh, pre and post scripts within a Veeam job to disconnect the repository. Um, the primary reason I say this is because Veeam might get quite upset if you use a single access immutable repository like a hardened repository and then try and reconnect and disconnect the scripts. Um, but what I tend to see is most customers are just using immutability over tape now. Um, the only thing is tape is primarily used for the long term side of things. So short term, if I let me simplify, if you're using tape just to have immutability or air gap, then disk or hardened repo will be fine for you. If you're using tape for immutable long-term storage, then you're probably better off going for immutable deep archive or something like that. No, you're not limited by the amount of immutable storage locations. You can have immutable storage in as many locations as I guess you can manage. So you can have immutability on premises. You could have two, three, four, five hardened repositories. That's completely fine. Um, same for cloud. So you could use um, any of our S3 compatible supported partners. Um, you could go to VCSP. You could go to um, AWS. 
you could go to as many or as few as you wish. We we don't limit that whatsoever. Um, and I think just before 11 o'clock, which means that I can give you guys two minutes back. I'm pretty sure I covered most of them off there. Um, again, anything I didn't, I'll reply to. Um, I'll work with the team and we'll do our best to get answers back to you. Um, in the meantime, it's nearly 11, so um, I won't sign off yet. I will hang around. Feel free to ask any more questions um, and I'll do my best to, to get those out to you guys or, or get them answered in, in text.